Salutations and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Kidology and I make videos regarding anything and everything to do with modern society. Today we're going to talk about why I am apolitical and why I have no inclination or desire or interest in participating or getting involved in modern politics. I would love critique because I would love to be interested in politics. I really and truly would. But I have this intense apathetic pit within me that I have quite securely been sitting in for quite some time now. I mean, if anybody's willing to pull me out, please feel free in the comment section to try. And hopefully at some point in my future life, I will discover that I am interested in politics. But at this point, nah, chief. Modern societies, generically speaking, are characterized by being, on the whole, democratic. And I say that very loosely, because I think the democracy of the modern age, that is modern democracy, differs drastically from classical definitions of democracy and what democracy, if we consider it etymologically, meant. Classical democracy very much associated itself with ethical connotations and with being about the common good and the common will. So according to the Oxford Dictionary, democracy can be defined as a system of government by the whole population or all the eligible members of a state, typically through elected representatives. And in more detail, democracy is a system of government in which laws, policies, leadership and major undertakings of a state or other polity are directly or indirectly decided by the people, a group historically constituted by only a minority of the population. Democracy was quite well and truly despised by Socrates, by Plato, by Aristotle, by most of the major philosophers of antiquity. But the that's not important. I think what's important is looking at how that definition of democracy, which brings into consideration its classical roots, differs so dramatically from what we see today. Modern democracy is, in my opinion, adequately defined by an Austrian economist called Joseph Schumpeter. Now, I don't agree wholly with Schumpeter's economic theorizing, and I didn't really gain anything from reading his magnum opus, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. But I did gain something insofar as he tried to redefine modern democracy and, well, representative democracy by really stripping away at the classical connotations of it being an ethical and moralistic endeavour insofar as it being about the election, the fair election of representatives to realise the common will and as such the common good. Schumpeter saw democracy, modern democracy, as being about the election of representatives. That's it. I'm just kidding. Schumpeter actually saw modern democracy as being about competition. Competition between elites who are seeking leadership and that this competition is quite frankly not about the common good. It's not about the common will. It's about personality politics. It's about elites maintaining their power and their hold over a country, over a people. And merely doing this and recycling the same methods, the same sensationalism, the same charismatic allure in order to just win the next election in five years time. Modern democracy is merely a method. It's a method in order to ensure that leaders are elected and that the process can just continue. There's no moral or ethical undertones to it. There's nothing terribly meaningful about it. And I have to agree with this. At the end of the day, the leaders who we elect do not represent the common will. They represent theoretically the majority 
majority population. And in most cases, not even so, considering the voter apathy which exists in most modern societies to this day. And I think that apathy doesn't have to do with people just being lazy or not having the education or knowledge about voting, but more so just to do with the fact that it is quite evident that political leaders don't represent the will of the voters. They are not held accountable for their five years in power unless they do something very, very melodramatic, such as in South Korea. But most of the time, it is merely enforcing, legitimizing or illegitimizing particular policies and being influenced by those who haven't even elected them, namely the civil service or lobby groups. Well, quite honestly, Minister, I want a job where I don't spend endless hours circulating information that isn't relevant about subjects that don't matter to people who aren't interested. <laughs> Surely not saying that the government of Britain is unimportant. No, it's very important. It's just that I haven't met anyone who's doing it. <laughs> Leaders impose and put forward their views, not that of voters. And according to Schumpeter, this is how it ought to be. And I must agree. I think it is the better of two evils, let's say. It is what it is and the way that modern societies have been conceptualized and manifest themselves are in this very methodical, bureaucratic way. And I, as an individual, am not going to impact that with my vote really and truly. The institutions, the processes and the democratic mores which we have are merely here in order to approximate what would otherwise be the common good. They don't actually realise it and they're just doing their best quite frankly. Whether that best is for all of us or not is well for everybody else to decide but ultimately I am not political because I do not see my individual vote as making a difference in the way that allegedly it does. This is one of the most important moments in the life of our country. I stand before you filled with deep pride and joy. As you may know if you've watched some of my other videos, I am South African and in South Africa our political system is South Africa is, in short, a soft, tyrannical state, I would call it. That may be exaggerating, but the dominance of one party, the African National Congress, who have secured voter loyalty to such an extent that they have been uncontested in every general election since 1994, is quite astounding. And it's astounding because whilst they have been in power, inequality in South Africa has not only dug its heels into the sand, but has increased to such an extent that according to this year's Gini Index, South Africa is the most unequal society in the world. And this is not just inequality based on racial differences and based on the legacy of apartheid. This primarily, I would argue, has to do and has been instigated and entrenched by the newly found and new money of a black upper class elite who have absolutely no thought, no consideration, no care for anything beyond power and the check that comes with it. Covid funds in South Africa were completely decimated by government officials, by these elites who are incredibly corrupt in general. Not one bar Jacob Zuma, who only served two out of his 15-month sentence, have been charged for corruption or for any scandals which they've been involved in. 35% of South Africa's wealth is distributed among 90% of the population. That means that the other 65% is accumulated by the top 10% of earners in South Africa, the majority of whom are white, yes, but they are not in power. They are not responsible for the distribution of government funds, the distribution of public services 
that is entirely within the domain and control of the African National Congress. And this is one reason why I am so against or so unamused by the notion that democracy is anything but a method of merely going through a process involving the election, the re-election or the new election of a leader and of particular elites. I think South Africa is an extreme example of what democracy can be, of how it can turn into tyranny, quite frankly, when the conventions of democracy, such as constitutionalism, the notion of the law being above the individual, the the balance of power between dividing particular branches of government are not respected. And I think increasingly in this modern age, it is becoming easier to actually genuinely ignore those fundamental conventions and principles of democracy because everything has become so bureaucratized, because everything is so wrapped up within, for instance, the civil service, that to actually get beyond that for democracy as an idea, as a theoretical position to actually get beyond that is, I think, a far stretch. Now, in being apolitical, I don't see myself as being above individuals who are political or who found themselves impacted directly by politics. And I think that this is also a reason why I am apolitical and able to be uninterested in politics. I'm not going hungry and the vast majority of people living in modern societies are not going hungry. There isn't that urgency or that desperation which has characterized really dramatic change. And I speak more so with regards to the left, the left being very much striving toward real, concrete, radical change, and that change being something that we ought to strive toward. And this is where I get to the crux of why I am apolitical. And this has more so to do with what I see online in terms of political spheres represented online and in the digital age. Leftist YouTube is a very intriguing and interesting environment and phenomena and what I find most interesting about it is that it is populated by intellectuals, by individuals who churn out information and ideas. I don't mean this in a derogatory way at all, I think it's phenomenal and intriguing but I do feel that a lot of the change which we are seeing, social change, particularly in the way of ideas and thought processes with regards to the use of racial slurs, the use of transphobic language, ideas of equality and the representation of communities irrespective of how extreme or extraordinary they are. The digital world is able to make space and is able to accommodate the multifaceted nature of the human experience. And this creates the illusion that what has been created and that what is possible in the digital world can be translated into the physical world, into reality. In no way am I expecting or am um, claiming that YouTubers, for instance, if we're specifically talking about YouTubers who are left-leaning or who are right-leaning or just political in general in their content and position, are somehow hypocrites or contradictory in not being able to translate the ideas and their imperative statements which they put out into the real world. I'm not saying that at all, but what I am saying is that there needs to be a realistic nuance to a lot of the arguments which are being put forward, because what is clear is that a lot of YouTubers who are political are so enraptured by this cultural or culture war, not the culture war, but I'd say just a culture war insofar as it is a war of ideas, a war of interpreting particular political phenomena and occurrences, that it takes away from the real gravity of individuals who are actually affected by the stagnancy and the stagnant nature 
of our political institutions and of the political process. Because ideas and the intellectual process is not scarce, because it is plentiful, that this can translate itself into reality, into a reality and a physical world in which everything is scarce. Everything from healthcare to education to the distribution of food to natural resources. And that in order to translate this non-scarcity of ideas and solutions and resolutions into the physical world, great sacrifices, which the majority of human beings are not willing to make, myself included, is not possible. And I think that Greta Thunberg is the perfect example of this and is also why people hate Greta so much. I find Greta Thunberg to be a fascinating young woman and I am rooting for her. Well and truly, I am. But I respect that my rooting for her is very much done from the comfort of my bed, watching her speeches, liking a video, following her on Twitter, that sort of thing. Nothing impactful, nothing terribly interesting or meaningful at all. And I think that is what inevitably the majority of her following does. What I've noticed is that Greta receives considerable hate and considerable criticism, mostly because she is now of age and for some reason the world has an absolute fixation on somehow being allowed to do whatever and say whatever to women once they hit 18 and it is vulgar and I have lost considerable respect, any ounce of respect I may have had for Ben, uh, for ben Shapiro. And uh, she's no longer a child, she's an adult so I can make fun of her as much as I want. Literally her entire job in life is just to run around yelling at the adults. The adults have disappointed us. Yo, you have disappointed Greta. Greta's disappointed in you. Except when she's dancing ecstatically to Rick Astley. Greta's very upset with you. I, I honestly don't know what Greta's gonna do with her life when she hits like 50. Inside here, they're all just, they're all just speaking words. Verbiage that means nothing, nothing. No more blah, blah, blah. I want an Oompa Loompa Daddy. I want it now. I want one. I want the world. I want the whole world. Greta Thunberg. Uh. But I digress once again. Greta for me represents what has to be done in the interest of actually making meaningful change in the real world. Greta has sacrificed her life, and I mean quite literally, she has sacrificed what as a modern individual her life ought to be, her life trajectory ought to be, going to school, going to university, getting a 95 job, paying taxes, flying on airplanes, eating whatever she wants at restaurants, what have you. She has sacrificed that. She has sacrificed her life, quite frankly. And not only does this deviate from the norm, it deviates from expectations of what a child should do and be. It deviates from expectations of what a woman should do and be. It deviates from expectations of what a modern human experience ought to be. I think whenever somebody deviates from the norm or from expectation, our response is to either fear it or to criticize it or to hate it. Somehow that's going to make it go away or that's going to make us feel better about ourselves and the decisions and life choices that we've made. So yes, those are the reasons why I am a political. Of course there are some personal reasons but I feel that I take a lot of my inspiration in this from one of my favorite political thinkers, Hannah Arendt. She didn't affiliate with either side of the political spectrum or with politics in general. What I see with a lot of left tubers who I highly respect is that they produce ideas, they put forward their ideas, they put forward their disdain with the way society is, they put forward their disdain with capitalism, and they make very valid points and arguments. But these ideas inevitably do not translate into the real and physical world. And I think that inevitably we conflate, unfortunately and regrettably, reality with digital and digitalized possibilities. The internet provides a space for so many communities, which is why it draws in so many individuals, particularly of Gen Z and younger millennials. And that's a wonderful thing, but it is done in the digital world and it has not been as readily translated into the real world. A real world in which the majority 
majority of people are aging at a rapid rate and are staying alive and living for longer, in which population growth is not as easily accommodated as it is by the internet. The internet and the digital world loves it that there are more people going online because that means, well, more money, obviously. The world isn't like that. And I think that this is something which left tube and leftists really have a problem distinguishing between whether readily or not is irrelevant. I think that it is something that isn't discussed as much. We live in a very individualistic age. We live in a time in which arguably there is no such thing as society. There are not those loyalties to community existing in the real world in the same way that we have loyalties online within online communities. We have more in common, we have more loyalties and trust among our online communities than we do with our own neighbours. I live in a shared house in which I haven't spoken to or seen anyone and these are my real life neighbours but I feel more affinity toward you who are watching than I do to anyone who I live with on my street. That's a problem and it is a problem in the real world that is not going to be solved by me just talking about it and saying that we need to change it via XYZ strategy or idea to a camera online. And I appreciate that and I am not trying to influence any meaningful social change. I'm trying to influence, I think, you as an individual viewer in you being able to relate to me or learning something from me and taking it with you into life however and whenever you want to and that's all I can really do and that's all I'm really prepared to do. I don't believe that humans are the solution or resolution to many of the problems which we face because the majority if not all of us are not like Greta and like other highly radical and sacrificial climate change activists or real world activists who have literally sacrificed their lives for their cause. And I'll be honest, that is just not where I am in my life at this point. But I think that a lot of us have to participate in the real world and the real world is definitely not as accommodating as the non-scarce, bountiful, plentiful world of the internet and of being an intellectual in the world. So yes, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you considerably and adore you and I will see you in the next one.